Hi, um, this is Clifford Brock, and um, I'm going to be doing the April um, Green Thumb Lecture, and I'm talking about bulbs for Georgia. And we're going to be starting with fall bulbs and then move into spring and summer um, bulbs. I like to do it opposite the um, traditional way, starting in spring. Um, so I am a horticulturist. I have a degree from University of Georgia. And um, I worked at the State Botanical Garden for quite a long time, maybe 10 years in total, um, both as a part-time worker and a, as a curator of the flower garden. And I'm also a blogger. I have a blog, which is on the screen. And um, I was an employee at Plant Delights Nursery, which is a specialty mail order nursery for hard to find plants. And kind of the, the overall basis of this talk is, is based on my experience growing bulbs at my mom's house, which is in Hillsborough, Georgia. And I'm gonna show you where that is because it's not very familiar. It's, if you take Highway 11 and go south about two, two hours from Athens or two and about an hour and a half, um, through Madison and then go on 83, um, you'll see it. And I've got it here. I don't know if you can see that little purple dot between Macon and Atlanta. So just north of Macon. And it's, um, here's my mom's house. This is an old house that was built in the early 1900s and it had a lot of bulbs in it already. And I'm going to talk about some of those heirloom bulbs. And then we're in zone 8A, which used to be 7B. So the same zone, hardiness zone, is Athens. So a lot of the bulbs that I talk about today will also be completely hardy in Athens. All right, so we're going to start with the September bulbs, which I consider kind of one of the the main um, pulses of bloom, like there's, you know, the spring pulse, which begins in like late February, and then the, the fall pulse. And one of my favorites is the schoolhouse lily, named because it is often seen as an heirloom growing around schools in the South, particularly Texas. This is a very common bulb in Texas. And it's a, also called the oxblood lily because of its deep, um, red color, like blood. And the scientific name is Rhodophiala bifida. It, it has winter foliage. Um, it, here's a picture from my mom's house, the one on, the, on, my, on my left. And then a picture from a house that I saw, I think in Raleigh, with multiple. So you can see what you can do with this ball. They're all that color. It's completely hardy. It has winter foliage. It's in the amaryllis family, which you can tell by the bloom, um, but it's much smaller than an amaryllis, maybe uh, 12 inches tall. And it cannot take wet soil. So it's a, 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 it's a plant for dry shade or dry sun, um, well-drained soil. And like all members of that family, it's avoided by rodents and deer. So it's a great plant. Um, it's kind of ex moderately expensive, like $10 a bulb. Um, but if you can find someone that has some, they multiply really quickly. And I've spread it all around my mom's house in various places. But I don't have a big colony like that. I'm working toward it. Um, another great bulb are the red spider lilies. And I know you've all seen these pop up in September, usually mid to late September, just as that first wave of cool air comes in and it, they multiply really quickly. This is the heirloom variety. There's a lot of different color forms and I'll show you some other, others, but this is at my mom's house and I've got numerous clumps. These were here when we moved in and they will persist for centuries around old homes because nothing eats them. And they just continue to multiply. Um, they're a great plant. The scientific name is Lycoris radiata. And you want to, find, if you're purchasing this, get the tetraploid, I mean the triploid, sterile one like this one. It's typically larger and it multiplies quicker and it has bigger leaves than the, 
Um, it can't take, it can take wet or dry. It can grow in ditches um, or in dry areas. And it has winter foliage, just like the oxblood. And then as with all the bulbs, don't cut the foliage until they yellow in spring. And I'll keep reiterating that because it's so important. People ask me all the time, like, why is my bulb not blooming? Why, why are they not blooming? It's probably because you haven't either one divided it ever or you cut the foliage before the photosynthesis was able to replenish the bulb. And it attracts these wonderful cloudless sulfur butter butterflies that I know you've seen. They also like pineapple sage. So if you have both of them in your garden, you're gonna get a lot of these yellow um, butterflies. And they're just wonderful. I love to watch them. Even though they're not a native plant, they attract native pollinators. And who, who wouldn't love these long stamens just sticking out? I mean, it's just a wonderful and it's an iconic Southern plant. It's one of my favorites. Here's a picture that I stole off the internet of, this is native to Japan and they worship this plant. I mean, it's, con it's kind of considered one of the national symbols of Japan. Um, here's a park that, that is famous for its um, September lycoris. And this is the same variety that we grow here in, in the South. And you can see in mass, it is just quite remarkable. And it's easy to, to really multiply and spread it around and it, it, they make wonderful clumps. So this is a plant that everybody should have in their yard. There's some other ones that I would also like to mention, the yellow, which this is also at my mom's in the front. And um, this is a equally wonderful plant. It does well. A lot of people think it's not hardy, but they grow it in Raleigh and they grow it in Charlotte. And I got introduced to it working at Plant Delights. It does seem to like kind of a sheltered area or like near trees. It does well like near the base of a tree or a rock or something to give it a little bit extra warmth in the winter, but I have them out in the open too. Sun or shade does better under like deciduous shade, not, not, not deep conifer shade. Um, and they multiply quick, but not as quickly as the red spider lily. They're, they're taller. They're up to three feet tall. Um, they're one of the tallest spider lilies, um, they have much wider leaves. And I don't know if I have a picture of the leaves, but the leaves are distinctive. And like this red spider lily, it has winter foliage. So be aware that it comes up with no foliage. So all throughout the summer, you see nothing. And then it, it'll bloom like in September or October. And then you'll see the leaves come out later. In, in the fall. So it's a winter foliage plant. They, and then they go dormant. And that's when you can cut them back. They come in other colors. I'm, I'm just obsessed with this genus. White, creams, pinks. Um, this is a, a white spider lily, which is a, um, a hybrid of the red and the yellow, even though it, crossing those, you'd get white. But that's, and it's a very vigorous, and there's many, many there's peach swirl. There's if you go on the Plant Delights website, they usually offer them, but they're like they're kind of expensive. So be prepared to pay like fifteen to thirty dollars for one bulb of these. And you can see in the background, I've got a yellow yellow one. So I've got these scattered throughout my yard. They're they're pure white ones. These are um, the surprise lilies. They're a little bit different. They have spring much later foliage that comes up in like January, February, as opposed to November. And they like a little more, more cold, but they do quite well in our, in our climate. And they have much larger petals. They're not the strap-like petals of the red spider lilies. And they're quite tall. Um, and then there's the, what I call the blue electric surprise lilies. And we have these at the State Botanical Garden of Georgia. And these tend to bloom a little earlier. I should have mentioned these first because they bloom in August, like when most people aren't out in the garden, but they're beautiful. I know of no other plant that has this kind of electric neon kind of effect. Um, 
they're also quite expensive, but they they do bulk up quite slowly though. So those are um, some of the fall, and now we're moving backwards through the summer um, when most of us are probably not that into gardening. Many of us have gardening fatigue by by July and August, the dog days. But I, I love having something blooming every week of the growing season, or even throughout the year too. Um, and I'm going to talk about crinum lilies. These are heirlooms. I know you've seen these around. Um, they have large. Let me show you the foliage. Let's see. Um, I don't have a picture, but large, um, kind of. Uh, canna, not canna, but blade-like foliage that can be like an amaryllis. They're in the amaryllis family. Um, they make huge clumps that are hard to divide. Um, you have to really get in there with a lot of sweat and dig them out. And they tend to grow around old homes, old home sites, cemeteries. Some people call them cemetery lilies. Um, and there's quite a variety of colors. The most common one is the milk and wine lily or the Hubertii. Um, and this you've probably seen, it has this kind of white with uh, red and it's a staple. I don't have any of that because I, uh, I tend to like to focus on the more obscure crinum lilies because they take up a lot of space. They're big plants they can grow. There's one that's six feet tall most of them are around three to four feet tall, but around three to four feet wide too. And they like full sun. Here's an interesting quote about them, um, that they've never died. You know, No crinum in the South has ever died. And it's probably true. They're almost indestructible unless you give them too much water uh, or you shade them out. Um, and they, Depending on the um, species, they tend to start blooming in like May, and then some can bloom into the fall. Uh, another one that I grow is Super Ellen, which I got from Plant Delights, and it makes a huge, here's the foliage, a huge, robust clump with giant, tall scapes of flowers that are that kind of dark pink and as you can see, it's a pollinator plant. They smell wonderful. A lot of them emit their fragrance at night, so they're pollinated by moths and stuff. But they're great plants. Um, quite expensive, because you can imagine, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite an effort to divide these things. And some of the bulbs are, are big, you know, like a rutabaga size. Um, so this one can get to six feet tall probably the tallest that I've ever seen. Um, and here's a general rule about planting crinums or most lilies or most bulbs in general, is that you want to plant them twice the diameter of the bulb, except a lot of members of the amaryllis family, which this is in the amaryllis family, um, like to be right at the surface. So like a lot of those spider lilies, you'll shoot, you'll see the bulbs like right under the surface or right exposed. And you want to plant it, these kinds of plants to, to the root collar, as you see there. Um, and um, that can be quite a job, you know, if you have a big, a big bulb like that. I tend to mound up the soil around them because they like well-drained soil. So mounding them up, they're completely, they're great plants for dry areas because they're so tough. Here's some more options for crinums. The James Hendry, which this is all over the flower garden. And it's a deliciously fragrant crinum. So go to the, um, the best time to go is June probably to see this one. Um, just walk around the flower garden. You'll see these popping up everywhere and they smell wonderful and they just get bigger and better every year. Um, another one that we have in the flower garden are these bacon eye hybrids, which are a hybrid between uh, Asian and an American crinum. And they tend to 
have narrow petals and they tend to spread as opposed to clump. So they're more like a, a spreading mint like plant, although they're not aggressive. This is one called Maureen Skink. And there's a there's one called Fourth of July, and they always have that peppermint kind of effect. Um, I call them peppermint crinums. Uh, another genus that you should all have that are quite affordable are the Zephyranthes or the rain lilies. And there's so much variety of these. They, they, sh they should be the crocus of the South. I mean, just as common as, as crocus are in the North and the West, we should be growing rain lilies because they're so easy and they're so adaptable to our environment. Um, they, I love the common names like fairy lily, zephyr lily, rain lily, um, the wonderful, um, I love common names because they're just so colorful. Oh, and I forgot to mention the spider lily. One of the common names is hurricane lily because it tends to bloom just as the hurricanes get going in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and I, I always thought that was a great, um, but rain lilies are easy to grow. And there's many varieties. They bloom in spring to September. They're drought tolerant. They often bloom after um, rains or heavy thunderstorms. So you'll see a profusion of blooming. And they're tolerant of, of dry to wet. Um, like I said, they're easy to grow. They're easy to divide, multiply. They're small. They're in the amaryllis family, which means they're avoided by deer and rodents. And they have a wide range of color and they're cheaper than most other bulbs because they're so small and easy to propagate. Um, the first one I'd like to talk about is the white rain lily, which is probably the most common. This is native to South America and it it's probably the most um, prolific of the rain lilies. It, it produces clumps that are huge with many, many bulbs underneath. That would be like hundreds of bulbs probably underneath that clump. And it has a white bloom and it typically blooms after rains, just like most um, rain lilies. And, it, and one way to differentiate it from others is that it has cylindrical leaves as opposed to flat leaves. A lot of them have flatter leaves. Um, Adamasco lilies are native rain lilies and they tend to bloom in the spring. So they're not a summer blooming. They're, they're like right now or, or a little bit earlier. And I've seen them growing wild all over um, our area. Uh, I think there's some, there's, they're avoided by deer, which makes them extremely valuable to our, um, to our environment. And um, they are, like I said, native. They have a larger bloom than most native, um, most uh, exotic rain lilies. And they kind of resemble Easter lilies. They're always pointing up. And um, that's one of the common names is wild Easter lily. Like I said, they're native to swampy. They tend to like a little bit more moisture. They're not a, a plant that I would recommend for dry areas. They're a woodland, moist, near creeks and kind of boggy areas or swampy forests. I often see them growing with palms in the, in the deep south and they bloom in spring. Well, I mentioned here that they can grow in average conditions, but I think for them to really proliferate, they need a lot more moisture and they will spread via seed. If, if the conditions are right, which means like enough moisture. They're kind of hard to find. I think a lot of native plant nurseries might carry them, but you're not going to find these at Lowe's or Home Depot, whereas you might find the, the other white ones in a, in a more traditional nursery. Um, and they are an heirloom plant. I've seen them in around old homes. I think people get them from the woods and bring them home. The pink rain lily is another South American, Central American. There's a whole bunch of species, but 
the grandiflora is probably the most common. It has a large bloom. It's easy to grow. I mean, it's incredibly easy, fast to multiply. It has a beautiful pink flower with uh, stamens sticking out. That's one way to tell. And um, always in threes. So these are all monocots. Most bulbs that we consider bulbs are monocots. So all their parts are gonna be in odd numbers. Um, and they tend to have, all monocots have parallel veins. So the veins of the leaves will always run parallel to each other. Um, this one can take any kind of condition. It likes sun or shade. I've got it all over the place. It's just, it's, it's just one of my go-to plants for, for anything. Here's another one that's really nice. It's, it's kind of a, um, it's a hybrid. It's called Catherine and it has a nice smell. Um, but there's a lot of, there's one called La Bufarosa that's really nice that I don't have on here. But this is at my mom's house and you can see her house in the distance. But I have it around an old pecan tree. And even if the foliage gets cut, it seems to still bloom and it's an incredible resilient plant. Although like all bulbs, I would wait till the foliage begins to yellow before I cut it. Yellow rain lily, there are a few yellows, there are not many, but my favorite one is called Midas Touch and it's a, hybrid, it's a recent hybrid and I got it from Plant Delights and he offers it maybe every other year or so. But if you can find this one, it's a great one. There's some at the Botanical Garden that I planted years ago and it's made a nice clump. I think it's in the Rose Garden. So if you look in the Rose Garden, maybe even in the summer, you might see this. And this is the, the photo from Plant Delight. And my experience is it's not quite as vivid as that. It's more like the one on the one that I took. Um, but it, it, if you like yellow and I collect yellow flowers, this is a great addition. It's, you know, it's about the same size as the pink one and it seems to multiply really quickly. So I'm spreading it around too. And I'd, I'd urge you to dig up your clumps maybe every other year and divide them and you can have you can have hundreds in no time it blooms after rains too um now we're going to go to something completely different which is not really a bulb but it's a monocot and it has a, a rhizome or or i'm not sure if it has a rhizome or what but what i'm talking about are daylilies um and they make a clump or they spread. This is a very um, invasive one that we see around road. I call them roadside lilies. I know you've seen these, like this is not my picture, but that's a great example of what you can see in like June, if you ride around Georgia. They tend to grow best in wetter areas, wetter ditches. Um, and um, they are eaten by deer, but they're so prolific. I think they kind of overwhelm the deer. They're edible to humans. All, all day lily flowers are edible. Um, they're not very good though. They can be, like I said, invasive. Um, I don't like them in the garden. I like to appreciate them in the wild. But if you want to, like a, um, like a, if you have a wet kind of grassland area, this would be a great Take care of itself and the best time to see them like i said is kind of mid to late june um orange ditch lily and here's the close-up of the bloom i know you and they, some of them are double like you'll see the floral plena example of that um but most of them are the single flower incredibly prolific uh, another plant for the summer that is is very easy to grow and, and can be invasive in the garden are the blackberry lilies. Um, these are called blackberry lilies because the fruit makes like a a blackberry looking thing and those just spread everywhere. Um, they can grow quite tall and they tend to flop over so you might have to stake them. Um, I see them usually at old homes or uh, Sometimes I've seen them at schools. 
old schools that still are standing. Um, they are actually an iris. They're, they, they've been moved to the iris genus, but I, I know them as Bellum can, candra or Bellum canda lilies. Um, they are easy to grow. There's This is the most common form, although there's some new hybrids that are shorter but I like the spotted one, the, the orange spotted one that's just so ubiquitous. There are a bunch of these in, if you're at the State Botanical Garden, in the, there used to be in the herb garden and they just seed around the edges, the periphery of the herb garden. But they're attractive both in fruit and flowers. So that's a great plant. Um, one of the, um, another heirloom that I had at my mom's house when we moved in, were the tiger lilies or the Asiatic spotted tiger lily or leopard lily. Um, they get quite tall and they tend to fall over too. So you might have to stake those. Although if they grow in a kind of a mass, they kind of support each other. They can be invasive. Um, I have them in a woodland area and they like woodland soils. They like dry soil, um, not too much water although I think they'll take average moisture, um, but they're kind of taking over an area that I have that I want to be native plants. So I'm constantly pulling them out and they're kind of hard to get rid of once they develop that form. They also reproduce asexually with bulblets. And I'm, if you've grown this, you've seen those little aerial black bulbiles along the stem. And if those drop, they'll produce a clone. So it can produce sexually and asexually. Um, but they're almost impossible to find in the trade. Uh, springtime. So now we're moving from summer into spring. And this is the largest, uh, this is the time of year that's so exciting. I mean, I love walking around Athens or driving around Athens or another old city this time of year because there's so much to see. It's overwhelming, in fact. This time of year, I almost feel like I'm tired all the time because there's so much to do. There's so much reading to do. There's so much seeing to do. It's, it's just a time of year that is both wonderful, but extremely exhausting, plant lover. Um, and I'm gonna talk about some of the native bulbs that I grow and Mediterranean bulbs. Most of our bulbs are Mediterranean because in the Mediterranean climate, bulbs are very successful. They don't have to compete with trees so much and they tend to like well-drained soils. So the most iconic bulbs like tulips and daffodils and crocus are all native to that area around the Mediterranean or the Middle East or Kazakhstan or into the arid areas of Asia. Um, and then many of these bulbs are fragrant and I, I collect fragrant plants. So I have to have certain plants that might not even be the best suited for the South like hyacinth because of their fragrance. <laughs> Many of the bulbs that we grow are also South American, like the amaryllis, the heirloom oxalis that you see everywhere around old houses, and iphion, and that's also called spring star flower, and we're gonna talk about that too. And they're usually planted in fall, like most of the nurseries will open their catalogs in the spring, and then they ship them in the fall. So the best time to buy them is early because you usually get a discount some places you do, or they may run out. So it's better to buy them early. And I'll give you some sources, some of my favorite sources for bulb, for bulb at the end. So early, so we do have a few crocus that I grow here. Um, and they, the problem with crocus is they tend to like a longer dormancy, winter dormancy, and they are eaten often by both deer and rodents like chipmunks and squirrels. 
So over time, they they tend to peter out, although there are a few that, like the Tommies, as they're called, Tomasianis, they're, they're, they tend to be, according to the literature, not eaten by rodents, although I think I've lost them. And they tend to come in blues and they tend to be a light blue. I'm not sure if this is a true Tomasianus, but it was purchased as that. And it's persisted at my mom's house. The one in the foreground is the crocus and the one in the background is the iffion, the spring star flower. And you wanna plant these toward the, the perimeter of a bed or the outside of a bed because they could easily be lost. I like to plant them among rocks. They like well-drained soil, sandy soil is ideal or loamy soil, not red clay. They tend to rot if it's too soggy um, and they bloom early, like really early. So it often like sometimes in January. Um, and then the golden crocus are also like mammoth and um, just this chrysanthus. I've seen these persist around homes and particularly um, at my grandmother's house, she's had them for decades. So in a raised bed. And I think that may be the key to their success is extremely well-drained soil over time. They cannot just sit in standing water. None of these things really can. Um, uh, like I said, they're great. They, they tend to do well in alkaline soil, which we typically don't have alkaline soil, but if you have a foundation that's concrete, they can take that extra lime, that extra alkalinity. Another plant that should be in every spring collection or garden are the hardy amaryllis. And if you wanna see these go right now or a little bit later, to the trial garden. There's a great clump of this, of these along the wall or the fence. Um, and they like well-drained soil too. And what you wanna look for are the Johnsonii or the voodoo hybrids. And they typically have a smaller flower than our, you know, than our indoor um, amaryllis. And they have wide leaves, just like any amaryllis, maybe slightly narrow but they multiply really quickly and they are hardy, like I said, and they bloom in April. Uh, just a great plant for our air. I've seen masses of these around houses, um, particularly in the deep South. Like in, if you go down to South Georgia and just ride around, you'll see these more common, but, but they grow perfectly well in our climate. It's one plant that I would really suggest if you don't have to try to locate. It can be impossible to find in a garden center. So you might have to order this. The snowbells or the snowflakes, I know that you've seen these. They, these are lacogems. They, they are so prolific in the South. They're almost um, probably the most common bulb that I see around old houses often in, in lines or patterns. I think people in the, in the late 1800s in the Victorian era like to plant things in rows. And I'll often see these in like boxes. Um, and they spread via bulb and seed. I've seen seedlings of these. So it, it can kind of wander around the garden. Um, I like to say it thrives on neglect. Um, Often I, I find the best bulbs around houses that have been neglected. If people start cleaning and cutting things, these will peter out over time because people are depleting the leaves. So I can't stress this enough. Um, just because it looks tired and old doesn't mean you should cut it and clean it. Um, you should be patient with these plants is if you cut them too early, you're not gonna get the profuse blooming and you may end up killing the plant. So wait till about late April or May to cut these back. Um, 
they multiply extremely rapidly. Um, and they persist around old homes. They're kind of an iconic plant for the South. They have these wonderful little green um, tips. Um, these are not galanthus or snowdrops. Those are typically, they're smaller. This is a bigger plant. These tend to be like two feet tall. Um, galanthus or snowdrops don't do as well for us in the South. Look for Lacoge. The Spanish bluebells are great. Also, although I don't see them as much as the snowflakes, they come in a wide range of colors. The, the most common color is this kind of uh, lavender or lilac bluish color. But I have a lot of these white ones and I like those better because they seem to be a little bit more, um, they, they last a little bit longer for me. I'm not sure why, they come up a little later. These tend to bloom after the daffodils and after the snowflakes. So if you wanna kind of extend your bloom season, plant these, they are eaten by deer, but they tend to not be affected by that. Um, they're so prolific, they spread via seed and clonally. Um, they come in pink, white, and purple. And some people consider them invasive because they will seed around natural areas. The scientific, scientific name is hyacinthoides. And it's probably more related to a hyacinth than it's not in the amaryllis family. This one, the snowflake is in the amaryllis family. So it's completely protected from deer. Um, Roman hyacinths are really the only hyacinths that I grow. They're a wild looking hyacinth. They have these kind of delicate, when we imagine a hyacinth, we imagine a, a thick, dense cluster of fragrant flowers. But these are more um, dainty and they tend to sprawl and kind of flop over. But they have a wonderful perfume, better, I think, than the, um, than the hybrid ones. And they do better for the, for the deep south. They will persist for decades, maybe centuries. I mean, I've seen, they were at my mom's house and there hadn't been any care done in her yard for probably 50 years. So um, they have persisted. Um, they are kind of slow to offset, which I mean, they, they're slow to multiply. So you have to be patient. Um, but like I said, they're, they're persistent and they're kind of rare. So they're, they're expensive. I, I ordered the white one. This is a white, um, even though it, it looks more like a hybrid, I think it's a white version of that, or at least I ordered it to be from Old House Garden. And it was kind of expensive, like $12 a bulb, but I wanted to have the white one because I'm obsessed with fragrant plants. Um, that's a great plant. Um, and it also comes in pink. So there's a pink version too. Our next, I, I, I wanna talk a little bit about daffodils because daffodils are the iconic bulb, probably in North America, the most common bulb that I see anywhere um, are daffodils, both in the North and the South. But in the South, we are kind of limited in, in what we can grow. We cannot grow a lot of the hybrids that grow so easily in the North, like the big cups and a lot of the, ones with the reflex petals, the petals that go backward. Um, but we do have a lot available to us. Um, this is a great picture of an old house in, in Georgia with, with this, this plant, which is the Campernel um, jonquil. It's a hybrid between a jonquil, which is a little dainty, um, Narcissus, all, all daffodils are Narcissus, that's the genus. And jonquils, as a rule, grow better in the South because they like that warm period and they persist for generations. Um, but this is one that I see very common around old houses. It's, if you just travel dirt roads, you could probably see them on the side of the road. 
um, they bloom in February. Um, they are, tend to be intolerant of wet areas. Uh, so like most bulbs, plant them in, in the upper parts, not in the low areas of your yard. And they can grow in deciduous shade or full sun. Um, and they are quick to multiply. I love dividing these and spreading them around. Often, you, if you walk through the woods and you see these, you know that there used to be an old home or some structure there because people planted them around their houses. Never cut the foliage too early. I can't stress that enough. I mean, we've had issues with this. I thought I was cutting them at the right time last year, but apparently I didn't. I didn't wait quite long enough. Um, and this year we didn't have as many blooms. And I think it's because of that. You want the foliage to look more like this, like on the right than on the left, like just almost completely collapsed where you can just pull it out. And in fact, that's a good way to um, clean them up is just to get in there and pull them. Just don't pull up the bulb, you know. And I'm saying late April here, but it may be May. I mean, it depends on how hot it gets. They tend to accelerate the hotter it gets. Um, but they, you know, by then they've stored up enough energy to bloom next year. I know you've seen this one. This is a very common one also around old houses. It's called the butter and eggs, or I think there's another name for it, but I'm not sure the correct name, but we call it butter and egg or milk and egg, butter and cream. Um, this is uh, kind of a, kind of a um, top heavy, like most of the double daffodils, they tend to fall over, especially after rains, like the rain we had yesterday, pretty much these were already gone, but if they had been up, they, it would have collapsed them. And they, so, I mean, there's a, argument to be made to plant more things like this because they will they will remain upright typically in a in a thunderstorm whereas this is going to collapse um but they're great they're iconic um and then you should always um increase your daffodils by dividing them and that will stimulate more blooming too all your irises should be done that way too. Irises really respond well to division. Tazettas are early blooming daffodils that are quite common. One that I grow most often is the one called Avalanche or Seven Sisters. It's, it's very fragrant, musky fragrant. Um, it's, it's a large daffodil. It's very heat tolerant. They're from the kind of North Africa the very hottest parts of um, the Mediterranean. They are, are the largest of the daffodils, quite large, quite robust clumps. They can kind of overpower other clumps of bulbs. And they thrive on neglect. I mean, just, just plant them and forget about them. You don't have to water them. You don't have to do anything. Just don't cut them too early. And like I said, they're, they're almost noxiously fragrant. It's not something I would bring in. I would bring in the, the little jonquils, but this I would not bring in my house because it would smell up the whole house. Kind of like a magnolia is just so powerful that it's best appreciated outside. But you should all be growing these because they're just so easy and they bloom regardless of the amount of cold they get, they bloom wonderful and they, they, a lot of people think they're paper whites, but they're related to paper whites, but they bloom later. They bloom like in February, whereas the paper whites tend to bloom in late December. Now we're going to move to tulips, and there aren't many tulips that persist in our environment. I often don't encourage people to plant tulips unless they, they, they should know that they will only last one year. Um, most of the hybrids a few of them have persisted um, in places, but as a rule, 
The only tulips I recommend are the species tulip, like this one, tulip clusiana, or the lady tulip, which is a delicate kind of tulip. You can see these in the heritage garden at the um, state botanical garden under a crepe myrtle, I think, or something. They like well-drained soil and they sandy soils best and rocks and stuff. Well-drained, I mean, that's a theme for Mediterranean plants. Um, and they spread, they clonally reproduce, they, um, they creep around, which is really nice. And they have this wonderful effect of, uh, you know, opening in the, in the daylight and then closing at night to make that fluted, iconic tulip shade. So that's a great plant. There, there are a numerous cultivars of the Clusiana type. Um, they like it dry and they multiply. It's easy to dig them up. You just have to dig pretty deep though. The, the bulbs tend to go down and that's a kind of a general rule about tulips. They like to be planted a little deeper than the amaryllis type. And then that shows you a picture of during the midday where it opens up. Um, and it's great to see the bees, they, they're, they're visited by bees. They often form seeds, although I've never seen a seedling. Here's a kind of invasive plant that I wanted to mention that is all over the South. Like if you ride around now or a little bit earlier, usually after daffodils are the Star of Bethlehem, um, Ornithocallum umbilatum. These are extremely common. Um, they're, like I said, invasive. You don't usually have to plant them. They just show up. I, I didn't plant them. They just kind of came in. Often nurseries will contaminate gardens with new plants. And this is one of the most common that is just inadvertently planted in a lawn. Um, but they naturalize well. And if you, if you leave them in your yard, you can get this great snowy effect. Um, so I like to have them. And they're easy to remove. Like if you don't like it, it's, they're not easy to get rid of, but you can just easily pull out the foliage. And they don't tend to outcompete other plants. So they're kind of a mild invasive plant. Um, um, trilliums are native plants that I'd like to talk about. Um, they are more expensive than other bulbs and they are woodland bulbs. So they're not the kind of plant that you would typically plant around your house, but if you have a woodland area or if you have a, a, a stream or a rock garden in the, in, in, the, um, in the woods, in a deciduous wood, then you should all grow trillium. It's native to Georgia. Um, they tend to be expensive because they're kind of slow. Um, an interesting fact about them is that they're not pollinated by bees typically. They're pollinated by flies and beetles. And often they smell, have unusual smells. Like there's one that smells like pine salt, and there's one that smells like manure and there's one that smells like lemon. So they're highly fragrant, but you have to get up in them to smell them. Um, most of them like moist soils or just woodland type environments. And Georgia has the most species of any state, so we should really be um, protecting and propagating our toad shades. I love that that um, common name of and that image of a toad seeking refuge underneath a trillium. Trillium fatidissimum is native to Mississippi and Louisiana, and it's a great prolific. I got these from Plant Delights, and they just spread. They produce a lot of seed and they multiply, they make clumps. So that's a great easy one. Um, Cuneatum is the one that's native to our area. And you can see these at Memorial Park at the State Botanical Garden. This is a yellow or green variety that just naturally occurs. Um, you often see, they often tend to be a fleshy colored or a burgundy, but these are yellow. Um, some other options are lancifolium, which is, has these long um, narrow petals. And that's also native to Georgia. And it's also quite common in floodplains. Um, 
I will say that deer eat these, so protect them from deer. Um, if you have these in your woodland, put a cage around them or put rocks around or some kind of obstacle um, to protect them because deer love them. And that's a big problem with our native trillium is that because the deer population has increased, we're losing a lot of trillium. And if they get continually eaten, they won't reproduce and they will eventually die because they won't be able to photosynthesize. So we should be lobbying our politicians to do something with the deer because they're having a detrimental effect on trillium and other things. This one's, I don't know what this one was. I saw this one in the wild. Um, it could be maculatum, but it had a beautiful clawed red flower, fruity smell. This is one at the botanical garden that you can see naturalizing, it spreads. There's hundreds and hundreds of these cumbens. The cumbens means it blooms right on the surface of the soil. So this one is, you can find it at Plant Delight. You can find a lot of these at specialty nurseries. Um, I, I'm, I'm afraid that they're probably the only people in the South that are growing them from seed. Don't buy them from eBay because they typically dig them out of the woods to sell them. So if you see a trillium under $10, it's probably a wild collected trillium and you don't wanna encourage that. Um, more species, this is decipians. You can see that some of these have really dark foliage. I mean, they're all unique. Every pattern is individual. And then here's one, the twisted trillium, which looks like a helicopter kind of thing. The petals are twisted. It smells really bad, but I love to see the flies coming to it and gnats and fruit flies. Um, it's a great plant. Uh, and then here's some other native bulbs that I think you should invest in. Um, Bloodroot, a really easy native plant. Um, it spreads around. It's probably more common in um, like plant cells and stuff because it's so prolific. It spreads via seed. So each one of those flowers will make a capsule full of these fleshy seeds that are dispersed by wasps and ants. So if you have blood root, you'll see it pop up in random places because ants or wasps have flown it to um, to eat that little fleshy part, and then they discard the seed. So um, it's a great plant. It's avoided by deer, so it it really proliferates in the in the woods around, like Memorial Park. They only last like one or two days. The flowers fall off after they're pollinated. So it, it's really something to be appreciated in early spring. But it has a kind of because it's white, it really shows up well in the evening. It's a great plant to see in a mass. And then it has these unique leaves. It's in the poppy family. Wood anemone or anemonella is the scientific name. And this is a very common plant in Athens um, in the woods. And it's also called windflower. It's, if you can ever get a little bit of it, it will spread. Um, I have it growing with the bloodroot and the trillium, and it's just an easy plant to grow. M many native plants are not that easy, but these are pretty easy. And then another really easy plant that you should all be growing are the Eastern columbines. These aren't really bulbs, um, but I'm including them because they're just, they bloom at the same time. They're blooming now and they spread via seed. So the seed will often eject, not eject, but they scatter and they're easily blown around. And they're visited by hummingbirds. Um, that's a great plant. Um, so here's some, some, this is a very busy slide, but, but I'm including, most of the places that I purchase bulbs, most, most of the time I get my rare things from Plant Delight Nursery, like the Trillium, because I know from working there how they produce them and, and the care that they put into like 
properly identifying and labeling them. I mean, they are the, the pinnacle of rare plant propagation in the South. Another place that I really love is the Southern Bulb Company, which they have a lot of um, like oxblood lily type things, um, daffodils that do well for the South. So if you wanna focus more on a nursery that specializes in the Southern bulbs, go there. Eden's Blooms is in Arizona and they specialize in spider lily. So they have all kinds of white and yellow and unusual spider lilies. Some of them are quite expensive, but they have the huge variety of um, Lycoris. And then Old House Gardens, even though they're in, um, I think they're in Michigan, they have a lot of heirloom varieties of hyacinth. That's where I got my Roman hyacinths. Um, so that's a great place for that and crocus and species plants. Telos, Telos has a lot of um, rain lilies. So if you're looking for rain lilies, go to either Plantholites or Telos. Um, or even eBay has a lot of rain lilies. They tend to be cheap and you shouldn't probably pay more than $15. Um, and even when you typically order them, they come in clumps so you can divide them. Um, another place is Baldmeister. They have a lot of, uh, they're in, I think, um, Missouri. And they have a lot of spider lilies. Um, and then Brent and Becky's is a very, um, a very popular place to buy daffodils and many other like hyacinths and Roman hyacinths and the Spanish bluebells. And then Terra Sia um, is, a, is a newer nursery in North Carolina that specializes in daffodils. So if you really like daffodils, go to the, I've ordered a lot from them and they usually send it right away and they tend not to run out. Whereas a lot of these other nurseries, they're already out of stock because during the pandemic, I mean, a lot of these nurseries were just selling everything they had. Um, so overall, I think um, I buy most of my plants from Plant Delight because I know that they're, identified correctly. Um, a, little, a little bit more about me. I'm, I'm, I'm currently living in Noonan, Georgia, and I work as a, a choir director. And that's why I couldn't do this live. I'm very sorry that I couldn't be there live, but um, I didn't realize, I was foolish. I didn't realize that this was like the week of Easter and Holy Week. And I had to, I have a lot of church obligation. Um, and I also work at a nursery called Southern Roots Nursery, which is a little garden center in, in Noonan. Um, but my real passion is writing and, and thinking about plants and encouraging people to grow plants that are suited for this environment. So much of our, um, our, our marketing is based in the West, like Oregon or if up in New England. And, we really need to focus more on plants that will perform and persist in our climate. So um, with that, I wish I could take questions, but I'm, you know, I'm being recorded. But um, thank you for listening to me. And if you have any questions, um, contact me. Um, and thank you. Cliff, thank you so much. I super enjoyed that. I'm sure everybody will um, on the 13th as well. I, I'll leave the recording on for a second. I can I, I know that one question that we were going to get and you covered it beautifully is, you know, where are some good places to start looking for some of these things? So I appreciate this slide on everybody's behalf. I was going to ask you about that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then something else, and you may or may not have answers for this, but this is a question I know I've gotten in the past for similar topics and didn't know if you had any insights is I get a lot of questions at the extension office about potential like hazards or toxicity of some of these bulbs for pets and animals. Um, is that anything you've had much experience with or do you get that question often? I do. 
mostly for house plants like mm -hmm. i get that question at the nursery a lot like is my cat going to chew on this i think outdoors there's so many things for them to chew on that um you can't really control that but um, if you have a, an animal that's chewing on a lot of things, they're not going to chew on um, amaryllis because it's so bitter. Mm. Humans can't. I mean, that's a natural kind of deterrent for um, mammals. Um, that's why the deer won't eat it. I'm not aware of anything that tastes good but could also be toxic except for maybe some of the mushrooms um, uh, and some of the house plants that cats tend to chew on, um, okay. like poinsettias and stuff. Um, yeah, I know there's a lot of lilies and things out there that are technically toxic to cats and dogs. Um, what I've heard, before, I guess it's sort of everybody's personal choice with what they want to put near their animals. I have lots of lilies in an old home and a cat and dogs and they don't mess with them. Um, but I know sometimes vets recommend if you have like a newer puppy that is just they're not really smart enough to figure yeah. out what tastes good and doesn't taste good. And they just start chewing on things and swallowing things. You may just want to fence some stuff off or think about that. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I've never had, a. have only had cats, so I can't speak about dogs. So. <laughs> yeah. So it might even be a good vet question too, if you're concerned, mm -hmm. but anyway, that I just, a lot of these curious. are very toxic though. I mean, like the, the daffodils are extremely toxic. That's why they, they live forever. You know. Yeah, there's not many things that are deer, almost deer proof. And I would say daffodils are pretty darn close. Um, that's cool. Uh, something else that is just, uh, I don't know if we'll get a question about this or not, but I, I'm curious about, and maybe some other folks out there too. It's great that you can divide a lot of these things. I guess a question would be one for a novice is when's the best time to divide uh, a clump of bulbs? And then also like, do you need to wait a certain number of years before you dig up and divide your bulbs? Yeah, well, I break all the rules. Like I, I tend <laughs> to divide them at any point. I think if you're willing to water them after you divide them, you can do it. I wouldn't do it like right when they're in their peak bloom because I want to see them mm. bloom. But a good time to do it is like when the foliage is kind of fading mm. and it's already photosynthesized. So it's not going to go through a stress. It's like in, it's entering dormancy. I've had a lot of success with uh, like spider lilies dividing them at that point. Or if you can remember where they are, like in the summer dividing them. That's what I was wondering is yeah. I was thinking maybe like summer before fall and sort of like planting them back out when you would plant bulbs. But that's the tricky part is how do you, how do you find them? I know. <laughs> so. But I, I, know, I generally know where they like I have clumps in, in rows so I can. And that's a good time because they're not going to go through a, a stress period. So like like you said, like right before they merge. Good time. But you want them to have enough time to develop that root system before they bloom. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. But with rain lilies, you can, I mean, I've divided them at any point. And, and you, for certain plants, you want to wait until they bulk up, like amaryllis. You wouldn't want to divide that right away. You would want to wait like three or four years. So you've um, got like yeah. a clump. Yeah. It's a mm -hmm. clump. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I'm sure we'll have some other great questions, uh, Nida, but like you said, I, I think you, you have your information on here and I'm happy to reach out to Cliff um, if folks have other questions that I am unable to answer because yeah. I have not nearly the experience with bulbs, um, but I'll pause the recording here. Okay.